Greetings. Welcome to our second presentation on masonry. In this one, we're going to be focusing on different masonry wall types as well as their detailing. There aren't as many slides as our typical presentations, but there is a lot of information, a lot of detail, so let's dig right in. All right, so up until the late 19th century, many large buildings were traditionally built with load-bearing exterior masonry walls. Um, brick, stone, very common, very common from colonial times here in Philadelphia. And interestingly, there's a very there's a very interesting progression from these large, thick masonry walls all the way um, up to the modern day curtain walls that are used in skyscrapers. If you if you study kind of the history of structural engineering, it's a very fascinating story. Um, and so, jumping into the limitations and, and why we moved away from these big masonry load bearing walls. Um, so they're not very good thermal insulator, so not, not a great R value um, that's keeping the heat in and the cold out. Um, they are very heavy, they require very large foundations, and they're typically limited to a uh, few stories in height. And also I'd add to this is that they're, they would also get very, very thick at the base. So um, people, owners would lose real estate, they would lose square footage essentially. And in cities, in Manhattan for instance, where um, where the skyscrapers were developed, among other places, the it was that it was that drive for real estate that was really helped to push to make smaller and smaller walls. Actually, that led to the curtain wall. All right, just an interesting side note. I'm going to keep moving on. So here's a view of a traditional masonry wall. So we see the wood joists up top bearing on the masonry there and. We can see masonry beyond inside the cavity there, so this was kind of creates a ledge right here. And then it also says, note the shallow arches, so pushed right up against the, uh, the joists there. So this, this is a traditional looking masonry wall. Um, okay, so here load bearing walls um, have been brought up to date now, so made to resist the passage of water, air, and heat better. They also include higher strength masonry and concrete, better insulating materials, cavities, which we'll talk about, and then other pieces that help are flashing air and vapor barriers as well. Um, the addition of steel reinforcing also have, has allowed them to become thinner and lighter, so very important in contrast to where, with where they came from. Um, often attractive for uh, economical low and medium rise buildings. <clears throat> So here on the left, this is a traditional looking um, masonry detail, the heavy duty walls. And then here is a contemporary version. So we're just going to move forward. We're going to, I just split that detail, uh, that, that wall section of the, um, the traditional one into two. So here's the bottom on the left and here's the top on the right, just zooming in so we can see a little better. So large foundation to support the wall. Here's the ground outside. Here's a concrete slab. Um, so here some blocking, which are wood joists, will sit on. And here, this is, I think this says air grating. Um, this is new to me, this detail. I'm not exactly sure where we're allowing this air to move um, to and from. Maybe we're venting like a crawl space, perhaps. Um, perhaps. That's, that's a new detail to me. Um, then moving up, so here we see the widths, right? We, we discussed this, so this would be a, a three-width wall or, or a two-width. I guess this is interlocked. I'm not sure if you call this two or three widths. Um, but here's the cavity. There is a cavity built in, and then there are ties holding one width to the other width. Um, then we have a stone sill here underneath the window, and this tie is a stoneware, so it's like a ceramic tie of sorts. And then we move from the bottom of the window down here to the top of the window. And we do have some flashing over the windowsill here. Um, that's the relieving arch that's um, supporting the, uh, allowing the, the loads to transfer over the windows. And then we see ceiling and more air grating here. And again, I'm not really sure where we're, what we're venting, where this air is actually coming and going. Um, but regardless, that's a, that's a, closer look at a traditional load-bearing wall. All right, moving on to a modern-day wall. All right, so starting, let's just start down at the bottom here. So here we have our foundation. Here we have our CMU wall. So that's our concrete masonry wall here in this plane. 
On the outside, we have our brick facing. And then let's just move up and read off the, um, the annotation. So here we have rigid insulation up against the load-bearing wall. Then we have an airspace in between the brick and the insulation. And horizontal joint reinforce, reinforcement at 16 inches on center vertically. So these are running um, in, in, the, in the beds, in the mortar beds, horizontally. And they're happening every 16 inches. So about every four bricks or so. Then on the inside, continuous bomb, bond beams. We're going to talk more about those. They often occur underneath floors. And there's our floor or precast concrete plank bearing on a um, bond beam. And again, the same happens up here. There is a bearing pad on the beam, the precast plank. Number three, reinforcing bars grouted solid. So here they are. They're vertical vertical rebar running through the um, cells of the CMU, the open cells, before they're grouted. And we'll take a closer look at that in other details. And then up top, we have um, some drywall being furred out with the channel that's mounted directly to the masonry. So a, a much more involved um, wall than the traditional one with more pieces. Now we're going to zoom in. I know this is a little fuzzy, but I really wanted to zoom into it. Um, so this came from the same detail. So I'm not exactly sure, but this is, this is essentially um, a, a common detail through this wall. So moving from, let's move from left to right on this one. So this is, this is for um, R value, for insulation. When they calculate R value, they actually um, provide a, a, a fraction of a point for an air film here on the exterior and here on the interior, so that the air actually um, provides a little, a little resistance to um, the flow of heat or the passage of heat. So air, so that's why that's here. You, in, in a construction document, you would never call out the air film. So this detail is really um, used to talk about the insulating qualities of this wall. So that's why we see it here. So then we have brick on the outside. Then we have an airspace, a reflective airspace. I'm going to talk about this, um, all this text at the bottom in a moment and address the reflective quality of it. So brick, airspace, insulation, CMU. Um, then we have another airspace here. This one's to run electrical wires through, and that's furred out with our one and a half inch drywall channels that are mounted to the CMU. And then we have our drywall, and then again, air film. So just quickly here, this reflective insulation systems. Hopefully we'll get to um, a presentation just on insulation. But it's definitely worth men mentioning here. It's a critical part of the story of the development of these walls, Sim similar to the timber frame, how the infill of the timber frame just wasn't up to um, meeting uh, contemporary energy codes. Same with old um, traditional masonry. So they had to be reinvented. And the, the, the incorporation of rigid insulation is a very important step in that development. So very important. Um, all right, so reflective insulation systems consisting of a reflective insulation material and an adjacent enclosed reflective airspace have been used for nearly a century. So that's what this is. This, this airspace belongs to or is coupled with this insulation, essentially. So single sheet insulation faced with a low emittance foil or film. So when this rigid insulation is provided with one sided or when the insulation is one-sided with the foil or the film that it is important that that face with the foil or the film is facing the airspace all right so the insulation is provided with the film the film has to be facing the airspace so they're kind of working in tandem here very important point okay moving on so okay so this here down at the bottom, I noted that on the next set of slides, we're going to talk about five different masonry walls. The reason I left this slide in, um, I just wanted to kind of clarify what's coming up. So this is a, referring to, again, masonry load-bearing walls. And then here it points out that it could be a composite wall or a cavity wall. So two different varieties of a load-bearing wall. So these five types that are coming up are not exclusive to one another. One type is a load-bearing, another type is a composite, and one wall could be two types. All right, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, in load, and also here in load-bearing cavity walls, um, yeah, so this is just saying that typically the inner width 
is the load bearing one. So typically the interior width here, <coughs> excuse me, is the load bearing one and the exterior one is the veneer. Okay, and everything up here we kind of covered already. So moving on to the, uh, the five types of masonry. All right, so type number one is our most basic type, just uh, load bearing masonry walls. So these walls transfer the loads from the roof down to the foundation. There are structural elements. Load bearing walls could be exterior or interior. Either is fine. <coughs> Excuse me again. So some problems with our basic load bearing walls, especially the unreinforced version. Okay, that's why I moved this here. Um, or, or noted this here, the unreinforced version of a load bearing wall. So prone to cracks and failure under heavy compressive loads. So this, this is just heavy loads coming from above, straight down, pushing down on these walls, um, crushing them essentially. And during earthquakes, masonry is very, very prone to damage during earthquakes. Um, little ability to withstand lateral forces, so not a lot of lateral reinforcement when the wind and the uh, rain are bearing down on the side. And also cracks are likely to develop. So masonry and the, the brick itself plus the mortar have very little tensile um, strength. So cracks are, are a symptom of that. Okay? All right, so that's type number one, your basic load-bearing wall. And this last bullet is referring to the unreinforced version of it. All right, so now moving into the bigger and the better, the reinforced masonry walls. So again, we could reinforce them um, to build up bearing strength or other types of, or, or for other reasons, which we'll, we'll be reviewing. But just because it is reinforced does not necessarily mean that it's a structural bearing wall. Point number one there. The use of reinforcement in the wall helps to withstand those ten tensile forces and heavy compressive loads, so much stronger wall. Um, required at intervals both horizontally and vertically, so this will come per the structural engineer. The size of the reinforcement, their quantity and their spacing are all determined based on the loads and the structural conditions. All right, So the structural engineer would specify all this. The size of the rebar, um, the type of the reinforcement, there are other types for the, um, especially for the horizontal reinforcement, there are other types, and the structural engineer would specify all of this based on how the wall has to perform. All right, moving on to number three, hollow masonry walls. All right, used to prevent moisture reaching the interior of the building by providing hollow, a hollow space between the inside and the outside. So here we are on the outside of the wall. This is the, um, the better looking brick, the one that's more durable, that has to withstand the um, environmental elements. And then here in the back, we have the common bricks that are simply um, providing a structural purpose, but as to how they look, does not matter. Um, but we are trying to protect them from moisture. That's kind of the moral of the story here with the first bullet. So when water does get behind this wall, penetrates this wall, this cavity allows the water or the moisture just to drop, and then it is released through weep holes. And then we have a damp proof course here, this type of flashing angle drops, pushes the water down, or, or not pushes, but um, directs, directs the water down to this course that is provided with the weep holes. Um, so this void also helps with temperature control. When moisture penetrates the outer face, it reaches the cavity, as I just explained. And then hollow space may also be coated with a repellent coating or a damp proofing. So we'll see that in some other details where this face could be um, protected, further protected with a, um, a damp proof proofing membrane. Okay, so that's our hollow masonry wall. All right, composite walls, so not hollow. These are, these are um, bound together. Constructed of two or more units, stones, bricks, and hollow bricks of different types. Here we see the concrete block or the CMU, and it has a facing of the red brick, very common. Um, so, better appearance with economy, so they're inexpensive um, or on the more inexpensive side relative to others. Um, common two widths, that's what we see here, and they are bonded together here with this tie. So, horizontal joint reinforcement. Um, or steel ties, and that's what we see here is a steel tie. So very simple wall, very simple version. And we'll see a, a, another, at least one more detail here. Here's the details right here. So this is traditional. Um, so most commonly associated with traditional or historic masonry. So a lot of our Philadelphia 
um, colonial buildings would be constructed in this manner. Um, so multi-width, so again, here's one width, the load-bearing width, and then here's our other width, which is our protective face. Um, so the outer width is the stone or the brick, more durable, the inner width would be the less inexpensive, um, where durability and finish is not the same. Structural, structural um, performance, of course, but durability is really referring more to the elements, I think. The, you know, the rain um, and the wind just, you know, bearing down on these walls for decades. Um, so less porous, I would say. These are a lot less porous. Um, so solid, there's no internal cavity. And here, this is very important, the widths are bonded. So last class, we talked about all the different positions that masonry units are put in. So we recall the header units that are used to tie these together. If, if that were the case, we would see some of these turning back and kind of creating that interlocking puzzle. But that's not the case here. This is a more traditional version where we have metal ties. Okay, so another look at masonry walls or another look at composite masonry walls more specifically. And finally, number five is the post-tensioned masonry wall. <clears throat> so I have to say that I don't have any professional experience with this. This is um, kind of new to me, not, not post-tensioning. I've, I've definitely um, seen that before, but not in walls, not, not in this manner. <clears throat> more in floors or beams, beams in particular. Um, so what do we have? Um, let's just read down the bullets first. So constructed to strengthen the wall against forces induced um, by earthquakes and wind. Yes, so make, making a stronger wall. Post-tensioning rods are anchored into the foundation. Um, the rods run vertically between the widths or through the core. That's what we see going on here, right through the core. Um, and then once the masonry wall is completed and the, um, the, gr the grout is placed and cured, then the rods are post-tensioned and anchored with a steel... Um, plate, I think that on, on the, anchored on the steel plate, I think this would be the steel plate at the top of the wall, I think that's a typo. Um, so here is the plate right there, steel bearing plate, there's the rod coming through at the top, nut and washer. And that's what we see happening here, the fastening of it after the fact. And there weren't too many details to choose from online, so this, this is not a very common, um, not very common system. So I didn't really have my choice of details. This one's decent. So number one, we have a cap at the top protecting the uh, assembly after it's all secured and and, um, and um, the uh, post-tensioning is, is finished. Then number three, bond beam and reinforcing. So here is our bond beam right here, often occurring again at floors or at roof joists. Um, four is our deck, our our steel deck or floor being tied in, hanging on an angle, um, which is mounted on a plate that is embedded into the grouted cores here. Um, yeah, and then we see the rod running right through. Okay, so that is number five, post-tensioned masonry walls. Okay, so here's another detail, um, a good image, a good image. I find the, uh, the arrows and all this text a little um, annoying the way it's kind of um, going in every which direction. So I'm going I'm to walk you through it um, in the order that it would have been placed. Placed, yes. So here's our foundation, put in first. Then we have our vertical rebar, vertical reinforcement that I did not spot an arrow um, calling them out, but they would most likely be embedded into the foundation. Then the blocks would be placed over the rebar, dropped to the bottom, placed, not really dropped. And um, and then what would happen, just to, just to continue what we don't see, is that we would have another piece of rebar would be fastened to this one, mechanically fastened to this one, and then they would continue up. So um, they would only put on pieces of rebar that are of reasonable height to put the, um, the uh, CMU over them. But that's not to say that the rebar will not continue up. Okay, so back to footing, to rebar, then we are placing the CMU units, and as we are doing that, we are also placing the horizontal reinforcement here, which we see horizontal joint reinforcement with eye and pintle wall ties at 16 inches on center. So right there is the eye, and there is the pintle, 
and they are 16 inches away from each other. So every block we would expect to see one of these. And it doesn't say it here, but the, again, the engineer would specify that this was occurring on every other course in this illustration. Um, that varies from um, wall to wall, engineer to engineer. All right, so we're laying in the CMU. We have the reinforcement in place. And then when that is complete, we will move down to the bottom. And next we would install here the air, moisture, and vapor barriers as required. So again, this is just a um, nothing specific, um, but something would be most likely, um, again, put against this wall, a bitumous, uh, self-adhering, probably, uh, moisture barrier. So something would happen there. And then the flashing would occur at the bottom. So here we are with flexible flashing flush with the outside face of brick. So the fl flashing is placed brought out to the face of the brick out here, brought up nearly two courses, and then fastened here with a mechanical fastened termination bar um, with continuous sealant at top. So we place the flashing and then run this bar across the top to mechanically seal it. So what we don't want is water getting to this wall. So anything that comes down is going to get shed down and out. Um, all right, so after that is placed, then we would put in our insulation um, around the fat, around these um, fasteners here. And once the insulation is placed, down at the bottom, the mortar drop and collection device, MDCD. So that's if mortar, while the masons are, are putting this brick wall in place, if mortar is falling down, it is not getting all the way down to the bottom and clogging the weak vent inserts. So again, if moisture gets behind the bricks, we want it to travel down and out through these weeps. So this 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 is um, you, you could look at, look this up. This is like a um, a mesh essentially that would um, is firm enough, strong enough to uh, just kind of um, let the let the mortar that drops just fall and not damage it. But um, water would still be able to penetrate this mesh essentially, and then the brick. Finally, the brick is put in place. So um, that's a nice looking detail. And, and you might choose to um, look at this here, the International Masonry Institute. If you just Google that and put in their detailing series, you're going to see a lot of good images, um, nice and clear. OK, moving on. All right, so now um, I believe this is the final part. And we're going to look at bond beams and columns. So. Um, for bond beams, so a course of trough-shaped units laid in a wall, so that's what we see here, and they're grouted after the fact. So this is um, put in for structural purposes. So again, um, often at the top of walls and um, where the um, floor plates would be tying into the wall, we would put in the bond beam for extra reinforcing. So reinforcing bars are placed in the trough, that's what we see right here, one and two, three and four. They would meet and they'd be tied at the corner. Um, and then shear transfer rods that connect the beam to the masonry above and below. That we don't see in this illustration. So there'd be shear vertical rods tying them in. We'll see that in the upcoming images, I believe. Um, and then another version, again, not too common. Um, the bond beams and walls are very common, here less so. Um, so here we have our precast um, blocks that are that are built up around the rebar and then filled with concrete and um, or grout. And then that creates a uh, bond column bond, or a bond column, I guess, like bond beam bond column. Um, not common. I've never come across them in professional experience myself. Um, bond beams, yes, they're always or very common. All right, moving on. So here's an image of a wall with two bond beams, one put in midway and one as is common, put in above the floor um, to help reduce the roof, roof or floor deflection. Um, reinforcement as required. There's our horizontal reinforcement in, in between the widths. I see it appearing every other, um, or not between the widths, I'm sorry, between the courses. I see it occurring every other course. Um, maybe not, maybe not there. So um, per, per, Per the structural engineer, I don't, I'm not sure where it's occurring. I see it one, I see two, I see three, I see four. So, um, what do we have over here? Tying the walls together. Yes, they can be used below the line of bar joist so that the 
choice to be anchored. We're going to see that in the next, and also as lintels over windows and doors. <clears throat> All right. So moving on. So this is a little blurry. Sorry about that, but it's a pretty good illustration. So here we see a two-width masonry wall. So here's our CMU. That's our load-bearing interior width. And then on the outside, we have it, <clears throat> the, the exterior width is the facing, which is more durable, protecting it from the elements. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, so we have our wall here, and then we're talking about the bond beam, so I'll focus on that first. Here's a bond beam. Here's our, our um, roof trusses. So I believe that they would build this wall. They would locate lay out where these trusses were going to be occurring and then they would field cut the CMU so they would cut this portion out right here that face the interior face to accommodate the joist and then I'm not really sure what's going on here it looks like a channel like a or a T kind of channel I would guess that it's being embedded in the grout so here's the reinforcement so they place the reinforcement and they would place this this kind of base plate that's gonna that the um, that the truss is going to be anchored to. I believe they would place that and then they would fill in the grout. That's what appears to have happened to me in this illustration. Um, and then once it's cured, then the truss could be placed and bolted in. Um, so that's the bond beam below the, <coughs> below the roof joists. And then another bond beam up at the top. So roof joist, roof deck, and now we are up in above the roof. So this is the parapet that's above the roof. And then for stability of the wall, they will tie in the top course with a bond beam that continues around. And then on the outside, again, then we have our insulation, we have our, um, our ladder type horizontal reinforcement running from the interior width to the exterior width. So they'd have to work the insulation in between where that occurs. And then we get up to the top, and the very top of the parapet, we have our flashing covering both widths, and then we have a cap on the very top. Okay? All right, moving on. All right, so the next two slides, I'm just going to go, we look over here in this area, and we go back and forth. The next two slides are um, describing different types of blocks with which we could build bond beams. So here are our basic um, CMU that have... Um, they're open. They're open top and bottom, which allows the vertical reinforcement to pass, pass through very easily. So if we're going to build a bond beam out of these that have open webs, then we need to put down the wire mesh, the metal mesh. So we, this wire mesh would be laid on the course below, and then we could run the vertical reinforcement through the mesh very easily, place these um, place one of these versions. Here we see the trough here. Place that and then we would put in the horizontal <coughs> rebar and then we would grout it and finish as a version one. And then version two is using a special U-block trough with no holes in it. So no wire mesh is necessary. And then there are little um, knockouts here or notches to accommodate um, vertical reinforcement the, at that location. Oop, I'm sorry. And then here, one final slide. So this, yeah, this is um, not, not the prettiest of drawings, but it um, kind of tells the story well. So here's our footing down at the bottom. Okay. There's our horizontal rebar or reinforcement running through the footing. Here it says um, three inch cover. Sorry, that's cut off for you, but that's what that says. Three inch minimum cover. So that's the engineers telling the contractors that we don't want that rebar anywhere within three inches of the bottom of the um, beam or the footing because then it is more um, this is where it needs to function structurally but we also like to keep it away so that it's um, less uh, less likely to be exposed from um, poorly consolidated concrete where moisture is going to leach in and find that rebar and, and it um, rust it out essentially so that's the footing um, <clears throat> then we have right here standard hook. So that's um, just a kind of a nondescript way to describe a piece of rebar that has a hook in it. Um, so that would be embedded in the footing when it is poured, and there it is coming up. And here the, the 
engineers specifying that that hook has to lap at least 25 inches up into the wall, so that is to that location. Then the masons would lay the wall and they would be installing the vertical reinforcement at that time as well. And then we would get up to the top where we see the bond beam being placed. And likewise, here we have horizontal reinforcement coming across the top, specified that we want an inch and a half of cover from that top. We have a standard hook, again, coming from the vertical grouted cells into the bond beam. And then when everything's in place, the, uh, the grout would be poured. And we would see, you see that in the, the hatch, showing it nicely. And that would be the procedure, all tying everything in so it's all really working um, as one unit, as one unit, yes. All right, good. So that was um, a lot of detail, so not too many slides, but a lot of detail, important detail on how these um, kind of complicated assemblies are put together. Thank you.